Hello, fellow true crime enthusiasts, and welcome back to another episode of Murder, Mystery, and Memes. Today, we're going to be discussing a case that's very close to home for me, but nonetheless very interesting because today we're going to be discussing the case of Carolyn Abel, an expat who lived and taught English in South Korea, much like my own experience. To set the scene of our case today, the year is 1988 and the Seoul Summer Olympics have just begun. Korea would actually host the Winter Olympics in 2018, and that's the year I moved to South Korea, so this case was extra eerie for me to read about. In 1988, after the Seoul Summer Olympics, there was a unique chance for South Korea to create a long-lasting market for foreigners to move to South Korea to teach English at public and private academies. At this time, it was relatively small and pretty much only offered in Seoul. Speaking English did a lot for South Korea, including opening up business opportunities, making it easier to travel abroad, and even became a status symbol for wealthy people to show off their English-speaking children. Our story today is actually about an expat who moved to South Korea in 1988 just after the Seoul Summer Olympics, and her name is Carolyn Joyce Abel. She was a 26-year-old woman who had been teaching English in Japan the year prior, and the year before that, she was teaching English in Nepal. According to her family, she had traveled abroad constantly since graduating college, and every few months to year, she would move to a new country. However, in her travels, she had fallen in love with a man, Ayagaki Tomoyuki, when she lived in Japan, and they had started a very serious relationship. They'd been dating for almost a year before she accepted a very good job offer in South Korea. Her and her boyfriend decided to remain close and continue dating, and even at this time, the plane tickets weren't that expensive. Carolyn had moved to South Korea in October, and by November, Ayagaki said that he missed her so much that he went to visit her in November and surprised her by proposing. Carolyn was moved by this gesture, but she told him she needed more time to make a decision on whether or not she wanted to settle down and he respected this and went back to Japan. Ayagaki Tomoyuki would later say that he was in love with the way Carolyn made him laugh and that he loved her deeply. He missed her every day when they were apart. But Carolyn had a big decision to make. Did she want to accept his proposal and settle down in Japan, or did she want to continue to travel and live freely? At 26 years old, that can be a hard decision to make. Carolyn was working at a private English academy in Seoul as an English instructor, and from what her family and friends would say, she was pretty happy with her life in South Korea for the time being. On December 20th, 1988, two months after Carolyn's arrival in South Korea, she didn't show up to work one morning which was unusual because she'd never once been late. Carolyn liked to party, she liked to go to the clubs, she liked to stay up late, but she also was really responsible and took her job seriously in every country that she lived in. The academy that she worked at was mostly students who were in college or older, so when she didn't show up, some of the other foreign teachers started talking to the students about her tardiness, and they all agreed that it was unlike her and it was worrisome. The academy owner actually asked the head teacher to head over to her apartment to check on her, and one of her other coworkers and three of her students tagged along. Her head teacher, Kathy Patrick, and her her co-worker, Sandra Ames, walked to her apartment to check on her. When they got to the apartment, it was a little bit after noon, and Kathy went to knock on the door. There's no answer. After a while, she checks to just see if the door is unlocked, and it is. Kathy lets herself into the apartment under the guise that this is to see if she's safe. Sandra would say that Kathy beelined her way to the bedroom when she entered the apartment, and that's not unusual for her head teacher to know where her bedroom was because they were pretty close friends. Just moments after entering the apartment, Kathy emerged and shut the door behind her before saying, Carolyn's dead. Call an ambulance. No. 
call the police. Kathy refused to let anyone see the crime scene until the police arrived and made sure that all of the students left. Her other co-workers watched from outside as Carolyn's body was brought out in a black coroner's bag. Carolyn Abel was brutally murdered. She had countless defensive wounds all over her body. She had been stabbed more than 30 times and had a deep cut from ear to ear across her throat. Her small bedroom was covered in blood from ceiling to floor. Her apartment was completely ransacked. Everything was thrown on the floor. The police immediately suspected that this was a robbery gone wrong, but there was no sign of forced entry and nothing of hers of value was taken, including cash, cards, and identification. So they immediately turned to the boyfriend, but his passport showed that he wasn't in the country even in the weeks leading up to this. He hadn't been in South Korea since he proposed the month prior. Kathy, Sandra, and the other co-workers began to believe that this attack could have been targeting foreigners or even possibly targeting Americans specifically. They began to fear that they could possibly be next. Because of the brutal nature of this murder, they believed it was a very hate-filled crime. Her co-workers were trying to find meaning in the senselessness of this incredibly vicious crime. They were afraid of what was going to happen next. But the police didn't believe this to be a hate crime because of the lack of forced entry. They continued to investigate whether or not this could have been a robbery, but they also were bringing in the U.S. Army detectives because she wasn't a Korean citizen. American Army Chief of Detectives John Boatwright was called in to investigate Carolyn Abel's death. And he actually was called in after an anonymous tip was called to the police by a Korean woman saying that she believed the man who murdered Carolyn was an American military officer. John Boatwright investigated this claim and the man explained that the woman who called in the tip was a very toxic and manipulated woman that he had broken up with the week prior. Detective Boatwright received Carolyn's autopsy reports about three weeks after her death and they revealed that her cause of death was not the cut to her throat but actually one of the puncture wounds to her right lung where she actually died of suffocation and bleeding out. Her throat actually had been cut after her death which, in his words, is very unusual. It's highly unusual for someone who's either robbing someone or breaking into an apartment to murder them, then stick around until after they've died and then go back and slice their throat. Detective Boatwright reasoned that the person who killed Carolyn was someone that she knew because of the lack of forced entry and the fact that at the crime scene, there were two coffee cups half filled with coffee left out on her coffee table as if someone had been with her that evening. This led him to question her colleagues, beginning with the ones who discovered her body, Kathy Patrick and Sandra Ames. However, at this point, it had been a few weeks since Carolyn's murder and Kathy Patrick had actually left South Korea to move back to America because of how devastating seeing her best friend murdered was to her. Her coworkers actually encouraged her to leave the country after witnessing Carolyn's dead body because she began to drastically lose weight, was not sleeping, and was in a downward spiral. Sandra Ames, however, was still in South Korea and she was brought in for interrogation. And she actually agreed to a lie detector test, even though those are usually inadmissible in court, they still can be a good gauge to see whether or not someone's lying to you or trying to deceive you. She was asked the simple question, did you kill Carolyn Abel? She paused for a very long time, a full 30 seconds, which I won't put you through, but it's deafening. And she finally just answered meekly, no. She would continue to answer every question like this with a simple no. When asked if she knew where the murder weapon was, no. Detective Boatwright could tell that something was off about the way that she was answering questions and decided to put more and more pressure on her about what she knew, saying, I know you're lying. 
The lie detector says, you're deceiving me. Tell me what you know. Did you kill Carolyn Abel? And finally, Sandra Ames cracked, begged him to listen to her full story about what happened the night of Carolyn's death. Sandra recalled the night of December 20th, 1988, the night of Carolyn's murder. She said that she was laying in bed when Kathy came to her and woke her up. She was covered in blood and stated, I think I killed Carolyn. Sandra said that she was in disbelief and asked her, with what? And Kathy responded, a knife. Sandra said, where is the knife? And Kathy said, I put it in her kitchen sink. Sandra would follow Kathy back to Abel's apartment, and that's where she found her friend's body viciously murdered, stabbed repeatedly in the chest. But no cut to her throat yet. Sandra Ames claimed that Kathy Patrick manipulated her in her state of shock to help her stage the apartment as if there had been a robbery. Sandra would tell Detective Boatwright that when she went to check on Carolyn's body to see if she was still alive, her body was still warm. And Kathy began to freak out saying if she was still alive, she could testify against her and put her away forever. And that's when Sandra retrieved the knife and cut Carolyn's throat. Of course, Sandra would say in every interrogation a different remembering of what happened with the throat being cut. She would go back and forth whether or not it was her cutting Carolyn's throat or if it was Kathy doing it. She said she couldn't exactly remember because of everything Kathy was yelling at her during this time. The only thing she was sure of was that she had washed the knife and put it away after it was done. Detective Boatwright believed the details that never changed in Sandra's story. That Kathy had woken her up, covered in blood, taken her to Carolyn's apartment, confessed to the murder, and then they tried to stage a robbery and clean up the scene. And then pretending like nothing happened, and then checking on their friend that they were worried about the next day. Sandra was placed on house arrest in July 1989 for five months until she pled guilty to harboring a criminal and suppressing evidence, and then she was sentenced to prison for one year in South Korea. Kathy, however, would remain in America until present day, untried, unable to be tried, because during this time there was no extradition treaty with South Korea and America. Detective Boatwright had been investigating investigating Kathy Patrick, of course, during his interrogations with Sandra Ames, and he discovered a lot of interesting information from their co-workers. Kathy Patrick was a closeted lesbian, and she had shown attraction to Carolyn in the two months she had worked there. She had actually confided in one of their other co-workers, Tamara Doak, that she wanted to tell Carolyn about her feelings, but Tamara told her, she's in a relationship, she's getting engaged, like, that's a bad idea. You're going to hurt your relationship with her and it's going to make the workplace very uncomfortable. But clearly, Kathy decided to do it anyways. And that's what Detective Boatwright believes happened that evening. Detective Boatwright theorized that that evening, Kathy and Carolyn had been hanging out and had gotten coffee together and then were spending some time in Carolyn's apartment. They had done this many times before as they were close friends and went out drinking many nights together in Itaewon. But this evening, maybe Kathy had gotten too comfortable and decided to reveal her feelings or possibly make a move on Carolyn. When Carolyn rebuffed her advances, Kathy snapped, murdering Carolyn in the heat of the moment. I do have to say that all of the theories about Kathy Patrick are alleged because she was never able to be brought to trial to find out the truth or to serve justice. Carolyn's family continued to try to get justice for Carolyn's death up until today. And they have pushed for Kathy's arrest in America, but after contacting countless lawyers, they never were able to find a loophole or a way to extradite her to South Korea or to charge her for the murder in America because the crime was not committed on American soil. Kathy Patrick moved back to America three weeks after Carolyn's murder, and she would remain in Washington state until present day. She moved back and worked at Western Washington 
Washington University as a professor for 18 plus years. And I'm not giving you this information as a way to dox her, but because it's relevant that news stations would visit her while she was working to interview or try to interrogate her about the case. And she would give the same answers every time. But Kathy was still sending letters to Carolyn's family. She was sending them letters saying like, I'm so sorry for your loss. I hope we can meet one day. And Carolyn's family was scared. They were worried that Kathy may try to attack them. Washingtonian attorney Stephen Schroeder worked alongside the Korean government and the U.S. military to help take a deposition of Kathy Patrick to question her about the incident so that there could be some justice and possibly bring Kathy to trial if they could prove she had something to do with it. But when interrogated, Kathy denied everything. She said that she had no involvement in the case whatsoever and neither did Sandra Ames. She refused to point fingers at anyone else and just was adamant that she had no information or involvement in the death of Carolyn Abel. Kathy was also given a lie detector test, which usually, like I said, are inadmissible in court but it is a good way to determine whether someone is being deceptive or lying in an interrogation, at least to move forward and pressure them into confessing. It showed that she was being deceptive, but she never broke character and continued to stay to her story. To clear up the timeline a little bit, this has been six months since Sandra Ames was sentenced to a year in prison, and she would be released six months early, but not because of good behavior. She would be released because someone bribed the Korean judge to let her out early, anonymously. But then immediately after her release, the FBI would take her in to help her get Kathy Patrick on tape confessing to the crime. Sandra agreed to work alongside the FBI to kind of corner Kathy into confessing. So she went undercover and asked Kathy to meet her for lunch. Sandra met with her and, wearing a wire, began to question Kathy about what she remembered because she had just spent six months in prison for this. And she was angry because she had been tried. She now has on her record that she was involved in a murder and Kathy got away scot-free. So she began to accuse Kathy. Kathy was adamant. She had no idea what she was talking about and she was furious that she would insinuate she had something to do with it. So that's when the case went cold. There was nothing they could do to move the case further. America wasn't going to extradite her to South Korea and she couldn't be tried in America for crimes that she committed in another country, allegedly. So 30 years after Carolyn Abel's murder, the television series 48 Hours decided to do an episode about her murder. And they decided to interview Kathy Patrick in a surprise attack at her place of work where she, surprised, shocked by the sudden interview, gave the same answer she gave 30 years before. We may never know who murdered Carolyn Abel or what actually happened on December 20th, 1988, but there was some justice to come out of this horrific incident. Carolyn's family fought for a change in extradition law. And in 1994, the American Congress passed a law allowing U.S. prosecution of U.S. nationals who kill other Americans in foreign countries. It has brought three murderers to trial since 1994. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Murder, Mystery, and Memes. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your comments down below. It really helps a small content creator like me. I'll see you in the next episode, True Crime Enthusiasts. Bye!